Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here on YouTube to have another video to help you improve your chess game. We've done some of this in the past, but I'd like to do it a little more specifically, which is how to review your chess game with an engine. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you play a game, the first thing you want to do is go over with your opponent, because your opponent knows things that nobody else in the world does, like why he did or didn't make certain moves. But eventually you want to go over the game with good players and with an engine. So what I did here is I'm on the ICC and I have turned on Stockfish 14. You can see the name of the engine. And I've told it to show me the top three moves. Okay, so what you're going to see here is the number on the left is what move number it is. Number one is the best move. Number two is the second best move. Number three is the third best move. The next number in parentheses is the evaluation. Positive means white's better. Negative means black's better, of course, measured in pawns. So 0.38 means white's better by 0.38 pawns at the start of the game. The next number in, parentheses, in brackets here is the longest ply depth that they're looking at, which is 29 ply, which is 14 and a half moves. And then here's the P, what's called the PV, the principal variation. If it's the second best move, it's not really the PV. It's sort of the PV of the second best move. You could also call it the MV, the main variation of the second best move. Once you see the move knight f3, everything else is the PV of knight f3, if that makes sense. But the real PV is the principal variation for both sides, which is the number one move. Okay, so I'm going to go over a game that I played at the Pan American uh, one of my all-time favorite games, I was black. My opponent was rated 2060. I was rated slightly higher. In those days, being an expert was really, really good. There weren't a lot of masters around. So I was a strong expert as black. <clears throat> so let's analyze the game. Now, obviously, if you have a, a database or an opening book or something, you don't need the engine for the first few moves. You can just look it up in the database, look it up in the book. I don't have my database built into the engine right now. So we're going to have the engine's unbiased views without the database in it. All right, so white plays d4. I play knight f6. White plays knight f3. If you don't know what to do here, if you're a King's Indian player, you can continue to play g6. If you want to play in the center and you want to play like a queen's gambit, you can switch to d5. Stockfish says, if you don't know what to do, play d5. I played e6. All right, so I'm inviting either a Queen's Indian after c4 and then b6 or maybe a Queen's Gambit if I play d5. Depends on what I want to do here. Normally, I like to play King's Indian kind of openings, but this time I decided to play an e6 kind of opening. All right, white plays e3. This is the characteristic move of the coal system. Black suggests that maybe here I should fiend counter the bishop just as if I'm playing a queen's Indian. I can also play like a queen's gambit with d5. I play b6. A little more dynamic than d5, keeping the diagonal open. And again, Stockfish says, all right, white's advantage here is only about 0.12. So what are we looking for when you're going through the game with an engine? You're looking for moves where the, the number drops way down. If the number drops way down, that means you did something wrong. So everybody has a different threshold. For a grandmaster, maybe if it drops 0.2, they're, they're concerned. If you're a beginner, that number has to be a lot higher than 0.2. It would be like almost, almost one or more. At my level, probably anything, you know, more than 0.2, 0.3 is worth investigating to see what I did. So you can play kind of what if games with the computer and say, well, what if I had made this move instead and then look at the evaluation. Also, note the evaluation difference between the top three moves, 0 0.17, 0 0.09, 0 0.07. That means that what White do does here is not a critical move. He could play his second or third best move and get almost the same result. So right here, the computer is saying at 28 ply, knight bd2 is number one, bishop d3 is number two, but the difference is within noise, like 0.03, so it really doesn't matter. It's not critical. All right, so let's see what happens. White plays bishop d3, one of the top moves. That retains his microscopic advantage. I fianchetto my bishop, trying to fight for the e4 square. The engine is telling me, yeah, it's a reasonable opening. White's a little bit better, which you would expect if you're playing black, that white's going to be a little better. But it's only around 0.19, so black's doing quite fine. 
White plays knight bd2, and you can see the evaluation stays right where around where it was before, which means knight bd2 is just about as good a move as any white could have played. He could also have castled. I play c5 and break at the center, and again, the engine is telling us it's still staying around that 0 0.17, 0.2 level, which means that, you know, both sides are playing reasonably. We haven't seen any jumps yet in the number, so both sides are following good opening principles. White castles. Now black thinks that it, the engine thinks I should play d5. I just play bishop e7. And now the engine drops down a little bit and says if white plays e4, which would kind of transpose into a Sicilian kind of game, but with white spending an extra tempo to play e4, that now white has a slightly more than opening advantage if he plays e4 right away here, which I'm letting him do, obviously. And he takes the pawn. Well, a lot of times in a queen's gambit, you wait to take the pawn so that when he takes back with the bishop, he uses a tempo. But here, I don't want to take with the bishop. I want to follow the principle, more pawns in the middle are good. And, and this is, again, what you can learn from the computer. Look at the difference between my best move and my second best move here. The difference is about half a pawn. So if you're one of those people that says, oh, I should take with the bishop and develop my bishop toward the middle, then you're making a mistake here. And the mistake right now is about 0.84 pawns, minus 0.16 if I take with the right way with the pawn, and 0.66 for white if I take with the bishop. So it would be a pretty big mistake for me to take with the bishop. So if you're one of those people that take with the bishop, the computer's telling you, don't do that. Now, if you don't understand why, and you, you go through the lines and it doesn't tell you, that's a good thing to ask your strong friend or your instructor or whoever next time you run into a good player and you say, why is it so much better here to take with the pawn than it is to take with the bishop? And, of course, one of the reasons is pawns have a lot more effect on the center to guard squares that pieces can't go to than pieces do. And now black has three big pawns in the center and white has given up his center pawn for a side pawn. Basically, what white has done is trade a D pawn for a B pawn and that means that black's going to have a lot more center control. So now all of a sudden we can see that by taking the correct way, I have a slight advantage instead. It's almost as if I'm white. So white plays rook e1, getting ready to push his e pawn in the middle, and I have to decide whether I want to try to stop him with a move like d5. I said, nope, go ahead, I'll just develop my knight. Stockfish says, that's a minor error. If he plays e4, he's back to equal. He plays c3 first. Stockfish says, the game is about dead equal if I play d5 or castle. I castle. Now he plays e4. And now I have a choice between playing d6 to stop e5 or playing d5 and allowing e5. Well, at this point I had played some French defense in my life and I realized if I play d5 and he plays e5 and sets up a Frenchy kind of pawn formation, it's really good for me because I have that extra d pawn in the middle and he doesn't and that makes all the difference in the world. So when I, I annotated this game for my book, The Improving Chess Annotator, I called the name of this game Faith in the Center, and it all comes from this move, which is I'm going to allow him to play e5 after d5, and my faith is that my better center will eventually let make his center fall apart. So I do play d5, and now Stockfish is saying he should just bail out and take the pawn with equality. He pushes the pawn to e5, which I think is the wrong idea, Stuckfish only punishes him by about 0.2 here, but I'm very comfortable in this position. I play knight d7 and attack his e-pawn. He plays knight f1, getting out of the way so the bishop can guard the pawn and also bringing the knight up to the king's side. And now I want to play f6 and break up his center, but I can't because after he takes, I'd have to take with the rook to guard the pawn on e6, and that's awkward. So what I do first here is I play rook e8. And again, if you look at Stockfish's numbers, Stockfish thinks I should play like a5 with maybe the idea of playing bishop a6 and trading off my bishop for his bishop. It thinks my idea of playing rook e8 first so I can play f6 and then take with the bishop to guard my pawn is not quite as good, but it, it looks deeper and it says I'm only down by about two tenths of a pawn. If I played the other move, I'd be a little bit better. And now he's looking even deeper and saying oh, it's close to, close to even. All right, so white plays h3, but that's a little slow. If you see what, it, what the computer is suggesting, he's suggesting the, the, the obvious follow-up knight g3 after he had played knight f1. 
He plays h3 with maybe the idea of playing knight h2, knight g4, and sacrificing the knight on the dark squares. But that's never going to happen because I'm going to play f6 way, way before the knight ever gets to g4. Okay, so here I play f6. That's my break move. It's a break move. What's a break move? A break move is a pawn move that attacks a pawn that can't easily go past him. And here he, he can't legally go past at all. So that's a break move. And the engine says here, if he plays correctly, takes the pawn, that actually he's better. So the engine thinks that instead of playing f6, let's go back a move after h3. He's, he's taking up my CPU, so maybe I should turn off the engine for a second. h3, f6, it says, Maybe here I should play, we'll turn the engine back on, top three moves. Maybe I should just play a5 or queen c7 first. I play f6, and he plays queen c7, and that's a pretty big mistake. We can see that e takes f6, and I was planning on bishop takes, and then he would play bishop c2. We can see the line actually gives white a pretty nice advantage here. Once he plays queen c2 first and attacks my pawn, then the engine says I could play f5 with advantage or the move that I played in the game, knight to f8, because I wanted to keep the, the center flexible here. So I play knight f8. Engine says he should take the pawn. Instead, he goes along with his original plan of knight there, and now all of a sudden my advantage is growing to about 0.8. And Stockfish says I should use the plan of trading everything off and then attacking the rook at the end. And if I remember when I was playing this game, I thought here for a while, and it took me a while to realize that. Uh, this is one of the things you do when you play slow games. You know, you're not always going to come up with the right idea right away. So I think it took several minutes. Let's see if I can check the book and see if I have the time stamping there. All right, do I have the time stamping on this? I do not. Okay, I just say I thought for a while. So here I find the right idea took me a while. First I played c4 and drove the bishop away. Stockfish actually says it's it's better to take here right away without playing c4. c4 does give his knight the d4 square. He moves the bishop back. I take, he takes, I take, he takes, and I play bishop there. And what's happening is my bishops are very, very strong. This is not the bishop pair, of course. The bishop pair is when you have the pair of bishops and your opponent doesn't. That's called the advantage of the bishop pair or just the bishop pair for short. A lot of people get confused, and they think bishop pair in English means a pair of bishops, so of course that means you have two bishops. But, it's, but bishop pair is really short for the term advantage of the bishop pair, which means advantage means you have it and they don't. Like if your parents are rich and your friend's parents are not rich, you have the advantage of rich parents. Well, that means you have them and they don't. So here, the advantage of the bishop pair is when you have two bishops and they don't. Well, nobody has the the quote bishop pair here, even though both, we both have a pair of bishops. Okay, so he plays rook e1, and now the question is, how do I get my central pawn moving so I can make use of my really strong bishops? And I think the engine says here, I should play either rook c8, or maybe e5, or maybe knight g6. I play knight g6, keeping an eye on this f4 square, which I've got guarded twice. He only has it attacked once. So I'm kind of controlling that square too. He plays knight f3 with ideas of, well, I can no longer go to g4 and attack, so let's get back and let's go after some of these squares. Here the engine thinks I should play e5 probably, very natural move, or maybe even the move bishop c7 with the idea of playing queen d6 and tying up his knight to guard h2. I play queen d7. I thought that was a good move because I thought that these, when I push e5, these white squares will become contested, and I wanted to connect my rooks and contest those squares and overprotect the e6 pawn. I was very, very happy with that move. The engine says, eh, white's probably about even now, like the other moves better. But it's much easier to play my position. My flexible center makes it easy to play. And now white plays h4. And as you can see with the engine value there, right now it's at 0.03 minus or plus. And as soon as he plays h4, it 
jumps down to minus 2.1. So what white wants to do is he wants to play like knight g5 and knight takes h7 and h5 and pin my knight or maybe drive my knight away first and do stuff like that. But it really doesn't work and you'll see why in the game. So what should he have done instead? Well, you can see the only move that really gives white equality here is to break up my pawns with b3 on the queen side. And it says if he does that, threatening to win this pawn, then he has equal play now. Once he decides on the wrong plan and plays h4, then black is better. So again, you're learning this from what the computer's telling you. The computer's telling you, if you play b3 and break up the pawns, you're at zero. Zero is equal, that's the best he can do. Every other move, the next best move is minus 0.7. Well, minus 0.7 is not very close to equality. It takes about a full pawn advantage to win a game, and minus 0.68 is two-thirds the way there. So <clears throat> if white doesn't find b3, he's two-thirds the way toward losing the game. But if he plays h4, h4 and I find the right idea, then he is losing the game. Well, one of the principles in chess is an attack on the flank is best met by counterattack in the center. Doesn't always work, but here it does work like a charm. So I play e5. I said, go ahead and play h5 and hit my knight. White says, all right, I'll hit the knight. If you go there, I can take it and get rid of my bishop that's blocking my rook and, and make give you a backward deep pawn if you do that. So I said, nope, not going to do that. I'm going to counterattack. And let's see what Stockfish says. Stockfish says, Dan, you're winning the game if you counterattack here. And if you move the knight, which is the normal thing you would do when a pawn's hitting your knight, you only have a nice advantage. But if you find this counterattack idea, then white is basically lost. So I play there. Well, you might say, but why can't he just put his knight in the middle? And the answer is he can, but then I can put my knight on e5. And now I'm threatening to bring my queen up on the king side, and I'm going to attack him with my bishop, my queen, my knight, and maybe my rook, and maybe these pawns. And I'm dominating the king side, and not only that, in this kind of position, this pawn on h5 is a goner. He, he, if I start attacking it with my queen and my pieces, he really can't save it. So white's kind of desperate here. So he decides to take the pawn. He decides he's going to take the knight and then take the pawn check because if I take his knight, his queen's going to be guarding my knight and he's going to win a pawn and get my h-pawn with check. But of course I had calculated this and decided that that was disastrous. And he took the knight and of course I have to take a piece back so I immediately took his knight. He takes my pawn check. Well, <laughs> I can't move my king to the f-file. That's kind of ridiculous. So I use the pawn as a shield and I play king h8. But now this pawn on f3 is helping my attack, and my bishop is attacking h2, and my queen can easily come over into the attack. And if he trades off rooks, my other rook will come into the attack. Not only that, I'm in some lines I'm threatening to play d4 and get this bishop on this diagonal too. So I have a completely winning advantage here. And you can see that the engine says that I'm completely winning already, even if white plays perfectly here. The evaluation is already four. So the game is basically lost, but that doesn't mean, you know, I'm down a pawn, so that doesn't mean that if I play poorly here, I can't throw it all away. So, you know, I have to play accurately, or at least semi-accurately, in order to take advantage because I'm not up material. The reason the computer says minus four isn't because I'm ahead by a knight and a pawn, which adds up on Reinfeld numbers to four. The reason the engine says four is because it looks ahead and sees that my attack is irresistible and I'm gonna be winning things sometime in the next, you know, 13 moves, because it's looking 26 ply ahead. All right, so he tries to trade rooks, but that just gives me control of the file. I mean, I was threatening to take his rook, and he could have tried bishop e3, but it wouldn't work. Let's show you what the engine can tell you. Suppose he tries bishop e3 to blockade this pawn and to, to finish developing his pieces. I would sacrifice this pawn, which is something I was looking at. Let's say he takes with the bishop. Now I play queen here, and I've got a pawn and a bishop and a queen on it. So let's say he says, well, I can play pawn up. And I say, no, you can't. Pseudo sacrifice. I take. I'm threatening a discovered check with mate. If he takes me, I have all kinds of ways to win. I could just play check. 
And if he puts something in the way, I can just take it off or I can push the pawn with a check and then take it, threaten to take it with mate. I have all kinds of threats of things that I can do here. If he mows the king over here, check. And it's not just winning the rook, it's also mate. Bishop here, queen mate. But as I said, if he, well, what else could he do? If he plays bishop here, Stockfish says, all right, I have, I have a rook and a queen on this rook. Just take the rook with check, winning the rook. So my attack is irresistible. So he just can't do this kind of stuff. You notice how strong it is to sacrifice that pawn and get the bishop into the attack. All right, well, that explains a little bit why I played rook takes, but everything loses. You know, you can see when you have a number like minus six, like here, so now every one of White's moves, you know, his best move is minus five and a half. His second best move is minus six and a half. His third best move is like minus seven and a half. There's nothing he can do to save the game now. It's already lost. He takes the pawn. It's like, ooh, look at all the ways I can beat you here. I've got the queen and the bishop that can come up on the king's side. I have the rook that can come to e1 and pin the bishop and pin the other bishop. I decide to play rook e1. Threatening. Queen h3, followed by either rook takes f1 or queen h2 mate. There's no defense. Now he's down 12 pawns. He plays queen g6, trying to get the queen into the defensive area. I said, all right, you can get your queen in the defensive area. For instance, if he plays queen to g2 now, I can play bishop h2 check. If he takes with the queen, I now have mate. If he moves the king, I have removal of the guard on the bishop, and I play check. And he takes, and I take, and he takes. And then after I check, if he goes back, I open up that diagonal again. Mate on the next move. All right, so back to the game. So it's completely hopeless. So he tries a little trick. He says, wow, I can't take your queen because... My bishop's pin, but if I can get rid of your rook, I could take the queen. So my opponent plot tries queen check with the idea if, if rook takes, bishop takes, and all of a sudden he's up two pawns. Well, the problem is not he, he's threatening my rook, but threatening my rook is not enough. Because if I take this pawn and he takes my rook, I have checkmate. In fact, <laughs> it's... It's my only move that wins the game. Bishop, bishop checks doesn't win. In fact, bishop checks loses, but I have mate and one. So he, he can't take the rook. But I'm threatening a million mate and ones. I'm threatening rook takes bishop. I'm threatening queen h2. I'm threatening queen takes f1. Those are all mate moves. And not only that, I have mate in multiple moves, and I'm also threatening to take off his queen once I save my queen. So he really has no moves here that hold off mate for more than a couple moves. Stockfish says the best he has is mate in five. He can sacrifice his queen with a check to deflect my queen. And now he can play f4 to block the bishop. And it says I'm going to need four more moves to checkmate him. So he's actually losing. So if we look through the game real fast, fast motion instant replay. We start out with a cold system. I play it a little bit like a queen's Indian. I let him play e4. He makes a mistake and gives me more pawns in the middle. Now I'm fully equal, if not slightly better. Both sides are playing okay moves. Knight d7, but black is doing okay. Now the engine thinks maybe this idea of playing f6 right away wasn't the most accurate, but it doesn't like queen c2 as much, says I should probably just play f5. But I want to keep the center fluid. He's still going for these attacks, which really aren't justified here. And now I come up with this nice idea of playing here. And this is where he has to start thinking about playing b3. This is the critical move of the game. When you go over a game, a lot of times what you're looking for is what's called the losing move. The move after which, no matter how well somebody plays, they would lose the game if the, other, if the opponent plays correctly. And you can tell when the number jumps from here on the evaluation, jumps from well below 1 to above 1. And when he plays knight f3, well, it's close. So that's close to a losing move. It's, it's 0.9. Now, I don't play the number one move here. I play queen d7, so it jumps all the way back down to around zero again. But now he plays h4, and now we're up at the minus two level. So that's 
clearly the losing move unless I blow it, and I didn't. I found the right idea, e5, he played there, and now I have only one move that wins the game, otherwise I'll need another losing move from him if I don't play the right move here, but I do. And as you can see the rest of the game, that number never goes below minus one. He takes, I take, he takes, I go there, and I'm, at, I'm up at minus four here. So after h4, he's not recovering, and now the position is getting easier and easier for me to play. I have this monster set of bishops here. My queen can't be stopped on the king side. His king side has been breached. He doesn't have a lot of pieces around his king to guard it. He takes the pawn, but as we show, everything loses. Let's play a different move just to show you. For instance, suppose he tries to bring the queen into the area and not let my queen get in there. That looks reasonable. Engine says, take the pawn. Let's say he takes with the bishop, but then I have rook checks and he, he's in big trouble. So let's say he takes with the queen. All right, I could play d4 and attack his queen. That wins. The engine says slightly better is to pin the bishop. And now it says he should just sacrifice the rook because he, he's really playing without his bishop and his rook. But what else could he do? You know, he if he tries to get, if he doesn't get the queen in the area and he tries to get the bishop out instead, let's say he plays bishop e3. Again, I have this d4 idea, which we looked at before, in a similar position, but I can just play, well now Stockfish is saying d4 is the best d4, bishop takes d4, f takes g2, if he plays bishop takes g2, engine says I should play bishop g2, let's say for the sake of argument he takes back with the king, queen checks, I've got a bishop over here, I got a queen over here, I got a rook preventing him from running to the middle, king f1, check, here, check, here, checkmate. So as you can see, he can play a lot differently, but no matter how he plays, I have all those same ideas. You know, he just can't get enough pieces into the defensive area to, to defend the game. All right, so what we've been trying to do today is not only show you a very interesting game where I, I play one of the better games I think I've ever played here, but also to show you how to go over the game with the engine. What is the engine telling us? Why am I showing three moves and not just the best move? because I want to see what's critical and what's not critical. I'm, I'm looking for those jumps where the computer jumps up and down by more than a certain threshold. The lower your rating is, the higher that threshold is going to be. Okay, so hopefully today helped you learn how to review your games with an engine. Um, if you'd like to, uh, to uh, subscribe to the channel, great. If you'd like to like the video, fine. And the best thing you can do is tell your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.